Naja. President Kennedy's challenge to America to send a man to the moon and return him safely by the end of the 1960s should have sounded premature. It was a bold proposal for a country that had only 15 minutes of manned space flight experience. Someone else had experience, however, the Soviet Union, and that made all the difference. It was the early 1960s at the height of the Cold War, and any Russian technological advance was dangerous to U.S. security and pride. It became a race. The starting gun had sounded on October 4, 1957, when the Soviets launched the first man-made satellite, Sputnik 1. One month later, Russia put a living being in orbit, a female dog named Laika. She was dubbed Mutnik by the media, but most Americans weren't laughing. Intercontinental ballistic missiles that launched satellites and animals could also carry nuclear weapons. The final blow to American confidence came on April 12, 1961, when 27-year-old Yuri Gagarin circled the Earth once. The flight took less than two hours. The United States hastened to catch up. A series of disastrous rocket tests preceded it, but America moved into second place with the launch of astronaut Alan Shepard on a brief suborbital flight. Shepard was part of Project Mercury, a calculated gamble to push ahead of the Russians. Seven military test pilots had been selected by the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. On the third manned flight, America succeeded in placing John Glenn in orbit. Three more missions were flown, and the U.S. accumulated slightly more than two days in space. Project Gemini, a series of two manned flights named for the Latin word for twins, was the next manned program. Gemini served as the link between Mercury and Apollo and featured astronauts common to both. During Gemini 4, Ed White engaged in the first American EVA, extravehicular activity, or spacewalk as it became known. The Russians were only slightly ahead of us now. They had done the same thing two and a half months earlier. U.S. momentum continued. Throughout 1965 and 1966, the 10 Gemini missions closed the gap and America began to achieve their own firsts. Among them were the first true space rendezvous and during Gemini 8, the first docking of two space vehicles. Gemini 8 almost ended in disaster, however. The linked spacecraft began spinning. Separating from the target vehicle made the problem worse. On the verge of blacking out, the crew got the ship under control. At the controls were two future Apollo astronauts, David Scott and, as commander, 35-year-old Neil Alden Armstrong. It had been America's closest call so far. Meanwhile, scientists worked on a rocket to replace the Titan boosters of Gemini for the moon trips. The answer was the Saturn, most powerful machine ever built by humans. It stood taller than the Statue of Liberty, and would launch the 35-foot-long Apollo capsule to its destination. The Saturn's ignition blast was brighter than the sun and would propel man faster than he had ever traveled before. The Saturn rocket was 100 times more powerful than the Redstone rocket that launched Shepard to the edge of space.
12 men would eventually walk the surface of the moon. The crew selection process had begun as early as 1962. Finally, these missions were scheduled to begin. The man in charge of the astronauts was Deke Slayton, director of flight crew operations. Slayton was one of the original seven astronauts of Mercury, but had never flown. Several weeks before his launch, doctors discovered an intermittent irregular heartbeat and grounded him. Ironically, he would now decide the lineup of each Apollo mission. During the summer of 1994, 15 of these men gathered as guests of honor at the Experimental Aircraft Association's annual fly-in convention in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. They talked frankly about the risks and joys of the program. It was a time of celebration, the 25th anniversary of the first moonwalk. Unfortunately, the risks had become apparent right from the start. The first step to the moon had been a horribly painful lesson. During a routine ground test of Apollo 204, or Apollo 1 as it was later designated, astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, the second American in space, Ed White, and rookie Roger Chaffee were killed when a flash fire destroyed their capsule. Well, on January the 27th and 67, we lost three uh, good friends and astronauts in a fire, the first real tragedy that had occurred in the uh, space program. NASA at that time was a gung-ho outfit. Uh, we had, uh, had not had serious setbacks, and it, it stunned the organization because uh, we had allowed a lot of hydrocarbons to creep into an environment that was 100% oxygen. A 14-volume report released after the accident speculated that a malfunction in the electrical system was the cause of the fire. In the pressurized, oxygen-saturated cabin, a spark spelled disaster. We knew we had trouble with that spacecraft. It was the first one. Uh, but no one expected this, particularly in a test on the pad. But I, I, I um, am always amazed at how the uh, organization got its act together. And uh, it, it was a remarkable turnaround. Uh, I was part of the investigative authority. It was also, I think, one of the most candid reports to uh, Congress ever made. We, we just got up there and said, look, we made a mistake, a big mistake, and it cost three lives. Uh, but we think we understand it now, and, and we want to go forward, and, and it worked out that way. It was uh, a fact of life that it was a dangerous business, and three people got killed, and, and, and uh, that we went on from there. Twenty months later, after several unmanned test launches, Apollo 7 was ready. The command capsule had been completely redesigned. The mission, extensive Earth orbit evaluation of the